everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you, and it's good to be seen. We're going to enter into his gates with thanksgiving on today. We're going to enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. As we sing this song, will you magnify the Lord with me and enter with us into praise and worship on this morning? We're going to sing something that's familiar to everyone. The song says, Lord, I lift your name on high. If you want to, you can clap your hands. You can stand if you wish and begin to give God some glory. You can wave your hands and thank the Lord for another day. Will you help me? Will you help me? Yes, yes, yes. You all know how this goes. Let's sing it together. Lord, I lift your name. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing it. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save. I'm so glad you came to save. Lord, I love to sing your praises. 
you got it. And ever. And ever. Sing it at home. For all you've done. Yes, 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 yes. For me. Blessings and glory. Blessings and glory. And honor and honor. They all belong. They all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Praise and glory belongs to God. Amen. Amen. Welcome to all of our friends, all of our guests, all of our Park Church members, our family who's here today. Those of you who are worshiping with us and with us today online, we praise God for your presence today. If you're with us online today, we have online ministers that are ready and available to serve you as needed. So we praise God for them and we praise God for you. We praise God for the opportunity to be able to gather in this way and and why do we gather today to remember and to honor the lives of those who are no longer with us you know the pandemic caused us to have to navigate loss in such a different way and for some of us this may be the first time that we've gotten together in this forum even virtually to honor 
to reflect, to remember, to celebrate. And so we praise God that we get an opportunity to do so today. We get to hear a word from the Lord. And we get to hear what God wants to say to us about how we navigate during this season of our lives. And so we give God praise. And that's one thing that I want us to do. Can we all just give an ovation for those lives well lived? Can we give an ovation for the footprint that was made, for the impressions that was made on us? Can we give an ovation for the legacies that were created and built? Because we do have something that we can hold on to even in the absence of our loved ones. And so we give God praise for that. We look forward to what God is going to say to us. We look forward to how God is going to move during our time together. And so we give God praise for it all. And so we're getting ready now to just uh, go. We're getting ready now to check out or look at some pictures in memorial. And so you can take your seats um, if you can. And we'll take a picture. Uh, we'll take a look now at some pictures in memorial.
If you're not walking, start while I'm talking. Walking up the king's highway. Oh, oh yeah, none can walk up there. But the pure in heart. Oh, hallelujah. We come to celebrate those who made their way. Those who are already there. And they say to us, <laughs> if you're not walking, start while I'm talking. Walking up the king's. Sing that chorus one more time. It's a highway. Highway to heaven. wonder of the Christian faith in times of loss, it's not that we don't lose people, it's not that we don't grieve their loss, but we do so with hope because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because he lives, we know they live. They're away from us, but they're present with the Lord. And it's ours to celebrate them. It is ours to remember them. The psalmist writes in Psalm 112, verses 6 and 7, the righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. Her heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. The writer of Proverbs, Proverbs 10, 7, the memory of the righteous is blessed. We, we, we who have loved ones who are no longer here, we still have some memories. They are precious. They are dear. They are loving. And they are life-giving. So even now, as their names and pictures are shown before us, we do so with thanksgiving. We do so with praise. And after that shall have happened, our memorial prayer will be done by Dr. Major McGuire.
get a little lonely. But the truth, the real truth of Jesus, love is hard. whispers I heard him say I, I, oh I will be with you hey say great say great secret Lord he will
Let us pray. O thou in whose presence my soul takes delight, on whom in affliction I call, my comfort by day and my song in the night, my hope, my salvation, my all. O oh, gracious and wise God, our Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Father, in the name of Jesus, on this significant day, Good Friday, we come grateful unto you for this memorial service. We rejoice, O oh God, even in our tears and sorrows that you are our Emmanuel. You are with us, and we say thank you. We thank you, God, for upholding us by your grace and by your mercy. Oh, gracious spirit, make your presence even more known to us this day. Enable us, oh God, to be brave and courageous in our remembering, honest in our sorrow, and open in love and compassion to one another. Father, we thank you. And we ask now, God, that you help us to seek not so much answers to our questions, but grant us the patience to mourn and to grieve. Oh, Father, help us to remember with joy those we have loved, those in whom we have served with, those in whom we have laughed with, those in whom we have fellowship with. Father, help us now to focus on that which enables us to keep going, to keep walking by faith, to keep walking in love.
love to be walking in hope. Yes, God, we admit that we shall grieve, but we shall not grieve as those without hope. For our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. God, remind us that time will never erase the precious memories. And God, we thank you for them. And we thank you that we are not alone. Even as we sit here this day, thank you, God, for the times we had with them, for the ups and the downs of life. But most of all, Father, we want to say thank you because we realize today more than ever that love is stronger than death. Help us to know that we do not bear our sorrows alone. We thank you, God, that you issued an invitation one day. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You issued another invitation when you said, cast your every care upon me, for I care for you. And so, Father, we say thank you. Thank you for every family present. And may you grant them grace in their time of need. And may you be the lifter of their heads. May you be their light in darkness. Yes, God, may you be their hope in sorrow. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for our pastor. We thank you, God, for the visionary that he is. And even as he stands to deliver the word, oh God, even now dip him down into the pools of righteousness and bring him up, oh God, with fresh manna from on high. Oh God, show him where you're working. And may, oh God, you continue to lift burdens this day. Dry every tear. Inspire and incite us to follow him who declared I am the way, I am the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so, God, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for precious memories. Thank you, Father. We love you and we honor you. And we give the remainder of this service unto you. May you get glory and honor. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the blessed Holy Spirit, and all of the people of God said, Amen. shall wear a crown I shall wear a shall wear a crown I shall wear a crown oh, it's all over
I tell my testimony how I made it over.
scripture reading for our memorial service will be coming from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, beginning at verse 17, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucif crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests and Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but, he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us tear it. But cast, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Whose shall it be that the scriptures might be fulfilled? Which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Now, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. And his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he, he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who had seen, and he who has seen has testified. And this testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being the disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear that the Jews asked Pilate that he might 
take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there, they laid Jesus. Because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. The word of God for the people of God. Jesus comes on Calvary. People came from miles to see. They say.
just to stay up there. To, to say, wait, 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 You ought to make that personal. He would not come down from the cross just to save himself. But he decided to die 
just to save me. You ought to make that personal. You need to grab a hold of that for yourself. He could have come down. And there are those who might say he should have come down. But he didn't come down. Because he thought you were worth it. He thought you were worth saving. He thought you were worth redeeming. He thought you were worth forgiving. He thought you were worth giving another chance. He thought you were worth being able to be where he is. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He decided to die just to save me. Just to save me. I know, I know, I know, I know what this should be, but I'm just thinking about how lost I would be if he had not died. If he had not decided to stay there. If he had not shed his blood on my behalf. I'd have no hope of eternal life if he had not done that. <laughs> Father, we say thank you. We say thank you. We, th we say thank you for sending your son. And we say thank you, God, for your son staying there long enough for blood to be shed for all of our sin. Thank you, God, that he stayed there long enough for every sin that we would ever commit to be laying on him and for blood to be shed for it. Thank you that he stayed there long enough for every ordinance, every statute, every law that could ever accuse us of having broken it. Oh God, he, he died to satisfy every one of them in order that we might be declared righteous before you. God, we say thank you. We say thank you, God, that, that he did it for the whole world, but we just want to make it personal just to save me. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, accept our thanksgiving. Accept our praise. Even as our loved ones who are in your presence are celebrating, we celebrate too. And we say thank you. Now, God, for the word that you desire to speak for all who will hear live and archive, we ask you to speak and have your way. Achieve every purpose that you've established. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We praise God for this worship team. greet you, my brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus, who declares himself to be resurrection and life. He gives the promise those who believe in him, though they were dead, yet shall they live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall never die. Certainly for those of you who are physically present and for those of you who are with us virtually, we share together in this experience, and we, we thank God that we are never alone. We do not walk through life as believers in isolation, even when we were somewhat isolated. We were not alone, and so now we come together in a more formal and physical way just to let one another know you weren't alone and to assure you you are not alone but there's a family of faith who love Jesus and who love you and are here with you from the passage of scripture that was read by Reverend Potts. I want to reread a couple of verses. Verse 25 reads, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother 
and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. And thus far, the word of the Lord. Ushers, you may be seated. Our presence today is a result of the merger between two significant moments. This is Good Friday. When we reflect upon the suffering, crucifixion, and the death of Jesus on our behalf. Traditionally, a seven last word service is held where the words from Jesus on the cross are preached. And more recently, for us as a congregation, it has been a time where we seek to make Friday good through redemptive acts of service throughout our community as a witness to Jesus' redemptive act on our behalf. But today, we gather not just in memory of Jesus, but also in memory of loved ones who have passed across these past two years, whose lives and passing we were unable to fully celebrate and grieve due to COVID. Yes, we held services at cemeteries, at funeral homes and other churches, but there was not the opportunity for the congregation in its strength to be together and therefore a degree of closure has been missed. Fathers, mothers, wives, husbands, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, mentors and friends, fellow church members whose presence we normally see in one form or another are absent from the body. And while they are present with the Lord, we still grieve their absence. We miss them terribly. And so we gather as those who grieve, as those who miss, as well as those who believe and those who hope and come knowing that we are not alone. As I reflected on what to share, I was led to the occasion of our Lord's death where we see Mary Magdalene, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, Salome, mother of James and John, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John, his disciple. With crowds present in mockery, with a thief present in taunting, with soldiers present in brutality and gambling, with priests present in jeering, they are present standing. They are present identifying with Jesus and being identified by Jesus. In the greatest of Jesus' trials, they stand by the cross. They stand by the place of humiliation, of shame, and of suffering. It's one thing to stand with him in the hour of joy and triumph and power and glory. But it's another thing to stand by him on a cross when hell besieges him, when heaven seems closed, and when glory seems to have departed. On this day, we see a mother watching her son suffer and die a death that he didn't deserve. No doubt as she stands there, she remembers that day when Gabriel visited her with the announcement of her being favored among all people, all women to bear, to give birth, and to rear the Son of God. She remembers tarrying in those nine months, giving birth to him in a stable in Bethlehem, being visited by shepherds and magi, pondering what was meant by their visits. She vividly sees the, the first, you know those first, 
first words, first steps, first sentences, first whipping, those firsts. She smiles at the thought of finding him in the temple at the age of 12, leaving the scholar spellbound and talking about his needing to be about his father's business. The wedding of Cana flashes before her eyes as, as the wine ran out, and, and she goes to him, and, and he says, what does that have to do with me? That my hour has not yet come, and she just turns to the servants and says, whatever he says, do, do it. And by their obedience, they, they, they come out with the best wine that anyone had tasted. She, but she has some regrets too. She regrets the time when she and other family members stood outside of a house where he was ministering in a misguided effort to do an intervention. They, at that time, they thought Jesus was a little crazy, that he, that he needed an intervention. And, and they stood outside of the house. And, and Jesus, rather than going outside, he told the people, who are my mother, my, my father, my brothers, my sisters, but that those who do the will of my father. So many thoughts go through her mind. She knew that he had come for God's purpose of redemption, but she never envisioned this. Yes, he would be Israel's savior, but not this. Not this and not now. He's only 33. He has much more road ahead, so many more people to help. Not this and not now. You ever had that? Not this. Certainly not now. That's where Mary is. And with, with each shuddering breath that Jesus takes, a, a pain goes straight to her heart. As strong as she tries to be for him, this is more than she can bear. When Gabriel spoke of her being favored, she never imagined this. How do you handle the evidence of favor dying before your very eyes? How, how, do you, how do you deal with having carried favor and now see favor crucified on a cross? Mary's there. John is also there. He, along with James, his brother, had left a fishing business to follow Jesus. It was his to be included among the three who shared special fellowship with Jesus. They were, they were there when Jesus raised Jairus's daughter from the dead. They were there on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses on one side and, and Elijah on the other. They, they were there. They were there when Jesus took them to a place in the garden. And when Jesus went further, he was the beloved disciple who knew how to access Jesus' heart, to lean on Jesus' bosom. And while Jesus increasingly foretold a day like this coming, John never imagined it would be this. They'd only been together three years. And while they were full years, certainly they could have had more years. Jesus deserves more years, and yet there they are. And Jesus sees the two of them. He sees them. He sees them. He sees them. As, as he hangs there on the cross bearing the sins of the world, he's not just a, the sin bearer. He is also the grief bearer. He is the sorrow bearer. I, Isaiah says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And he looks at them and, and he realizes that, that they are grieving and, and he's bearing that in himself. And my friends, what, what good news it is to know that, that our Savior didn't just bear our sins, he bears our sorrows. He bears our griefs. And therefore, having spoken a word of forgiveness and a promise of paradise, listen to Jesus now as he speaks a word of provision and love, saying, Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. With blood dripping, providing our perfect plea, love still flows from his mouth. The circumstances did not supersede his love. Woman, not mother, but woman. 
not a word of disrespect, but a word of respect from one to whom respect is due. Because before his birth, she said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, as her son, he come to love her down and be with her. He'd love to ease her pain. But if he did, if he did come down from the cross, her pre-birth testimony would be empty. Her pre-birth testimony was, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. If I come down, I can't fulfill your testimony. Got to die for, for your sin so that your rejoicing might be full. He knows it's a bitter pill for her. She's feeling her name. Mary. Mary means bitter. He doesn't have much to give her in an earthly way. Foxes had holes, birds of the air had nests. He had nowhere to lay his head. But he does have John. He's got John as his disciple, John the one who brought him joy, John the one whose name means God is gracious. He give her John, tells her, behold uh, your son, look upon him that you might know that even in the midst of your sorrow, God is gracious, that in your bitterness, God is gracious. And he looks at John and says, son, behold your mother. Look at her as one who gave me the flesh about which you will say, and the word was made flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And that would be the normal way in which this, this word from the cross would be preached. But, but God began to show me something else, Alvin. As Jesus sees them looking up at him, he tells them to behold each other. He redirects their attention from him to them. As painful as this is, uh, he wants them to know their lives must go on. Don't allow his dying to cause them to be dead to what and who is still alive. Their lives must go on. And friends, I believe that God would say the same to all of us. Life must go on. As painful as the death, the loss, the absence may be, life must go on. And the only way that life can go on is if our attention is redirected. Because we can get stuck in subtraction. Stuck in loss, stuck in the death, stuck in the absence. The death and its pain can be so profound that the image of the loved one dying is the predominant image through which all of life is now viewed. Our lives can quickly be referred to as before they died and after they died. I know, I know what it is to have Everything cataloged leading up to the moment of the death and everything that follows in terms of after the death and through the lens of the death. And when that happens, we are only alive to the dying and not to the living. The dominant image is who died rather than who is still alive. And so as they look up at Jesus dying, Jesus redirects their attention off of him and towards each other. He says, look at who remains. Look at who is alive. Because your life has to go on. Their lives can't be transfixed by the image of him dying on the cross. They can't be stuck. In him being on the cross, they must be alive to life, present to those who live, engaging a life beyond this most painful moment. Yeah, life must go on. Your life is more than the darkest moment. It's greater than the deepest of loss. And as Jesus redirects their attention, it's not just one of focus, behold, Behold thy son, behold 
thy mother. It's not just one of focus. It is also one of function. Function. To Mary, he says, behold your son. To John, he says, behold your mother. He gives them to each other in relationship as they both experience loss. He awakens them to each other and the invitation for them to care for each other in his absence. In other words, he says, as deep as the loss may be, you have love to give and you have love to receive. Let's be clear. Nobody could replace Jesus. <laughs> It'd be foolish for anybody to try to replace Jesus. There, there was and would only be one Jesus. But with that being the case, Jesus tells Mary that her maternal instinct need not end with his death. She has more love to give. She has more mother wit to give. She can still extend herself in maternal care and love to John. She can pray for John. She can impart wisdom to John. She can be a mother to John. Not only does she have love to give, but she also has love to receive. Jesus is the oldest son, and Jesus is aware of the responsibility of the older, the elder son to take care of the needs of a mother who is a widow. And Jesus, knowing what he knows about his earthly siblings, he doesn't leave it up to them. <laughs> Jesus said, I know my, I know my folk. And he, and he said, now there are just some things I can't leave up to them. Y'all know how it is. You know your people. And Jesus says, I, I just can't leave this up to, up to them. Uh, no, no, no. James ain't got saved yet. No, 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 no. I can't leave it. I can't leave it up. Leave it up to James. I, and so I, I've got John. His love for, for Mary says, Mama, you still got some love to receive, and you got to be open to the love that is John's to give you, and you got to be willing to receive it. He challenges John to take the love that John had for Jesus and give that same love to Mary, and for John to receive that, that love from Mary. You know, part of the depth of grief is the degree to which we loved and were loved by those who have departed. There is the care, the concern, the, the protection, the prayers that they extended to us as well as what we gave to them. And in their absence, we grieve not just them. We grieve what we gave to them. We grieve what we received from them. And Jesus says, I've got to expand the locus of Mary and John's care for him to their care for each other. And as, God, as, as Jesus sought to expand the locus of their care for him to each other, so does God call us to expand the locus of our care and openness to care from others beyond those who have died. In other words, we still have love to give. We still have love to receive. We have care to give and we have care to receive. We have protection to give and we have protection to receive. The instinct to parent hadn't left you. The desire for companionship hasn't disappeared. You have love to give. And you have love to receive. The Bible says that John takes Mary from that very hour. Jesus takes Mary and John's attention off of him and to each other. He refocuses, he redirects their focus and expands their 
function. And there's one more thing that the Lord would, would have us know. Jesus would have them not focus on his crucifixion because there was another revelation of him that they would receive. And their time of seeing him on the cross was not going to be the final time that they'd see him. The time of seeing him entombed in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb was not going to be the final time of their seeing him. And therefore, he did not want their minds fixed on what wasn't going to be final. While it would be the last time that, that they saw him, it wasn't going to be the final time that they saw him. Jesus had told them it wasn't going to be the final time. He had told them that they would see him again and their joy would be full. After seeing him on the cross and seeing him buried in the tomb, Jesus knew they'd see him in resurrection glory. They'd see him raised from the dead. They'd see him alive. They would see him for 40 days with him providing them many infallible proofs that he was alive. Then they'd see him ascending into heaven, and then they'd be given the words, Why stand ye gazing up in the heavens? This same Jesus that you saw being lifted up, this same Jesus is going to come back in like manner. And so Jesus says, I can't, I can't have you be so fixed on what isn't going to be final. I can't have you fixed on what is transitory. I, I can't have you fixed on what is temporary. This last look is not going to be the final look. And my brothers and sisters, because of Jesus, we are given the hope that our last look of our loved one is not the final look, the last look at at the house, the, the last look at the rest home, the, the last look in the hospital, the last look in the viewing, the, the last look at the cemetery. That's not the final look. We shall see them again. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For the corruptible must put on incorruption, and the mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruptible has put on incorruption, and the mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death! is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? There is another look. Oh, yes, oh, yeah, your last look was not the final look, for the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The last look, my brothers and sisters, is not the final look. We shall see them again. You'll see mama again. You'll see daddy again. You'll see husband again. You'll see wife again. You'll see sister again. You'll see brother again. You'll see auntie and uncle. You'll see daughter and son, you'll, you'll see your loved ones again. And here it is, if you could see them now. Lord, have mercy. Not only will you see them again, but my friends, if you could see them right now, if you, if you could see them in the very presence of the Lord, if you can see them in the presence of Jesus and all of the saints of the ages, if you could see them and all of the family members who preceded them in death, if you could see them right now, you know that their prayers have all been answered. They finally arrived. The, the, the healing that had been delayed, that healing has now been realized. 
nobody's in a hurry and they don't have any schedules to keep. They're enjoying Jesus just sitting at his feet. If you could see them right now, Lord have mercy, if God could allow the portals just to be pulled back just for a moment, to see them just for a glimpse, but here it is, you will see them again. Oh, I may not see you now, but I will see you again. Hallelujah. 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 You'll see mama again. You'll see father again. You'll see son again. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's why we get excited about Sunday. But Sunday lets us know Friday never is final. Hallelujah. We'll see him again. We'll see him again. Sip, we'll see him again. We'll see him again. Mm -hmm. My prayers have all been answered. I finally arrived. The healing that has been delayed. Now realize no one's in a hurry, no more schedules to keep. They're enjoying Jesus, just sitting at his feet. You could see me now. walking streets of gold if you could see me now I'm standing tall and whole if you could see me now you know I see you face to face if you could only see Though I have my sorrows, none can ever compare to what Jesus has in store for me. No language could ever share. You would not want me to ever leave this perfect place. You could only see me now. If you could see me now, I'm standing tall and whole. If you could see me now, I walk in streets of gold.
shall be holding. Hallelujah. Yes, we shall be holding. Hallelujah. Anybody glad about that? That's our anticipation. That's our hope. That's the anchor for our souls. Glory. That's what keeps us moving. Gets you up out of bed. Makes you face another day. ushers are going to be leading you as I, after I give the benediction. And we pray that this, the rest of this day will, will hopefully have some light and lift because of our being together. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday as we'll celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this time in the presence of each other and in the presence of you. For our Savior who not just bore our sins, but who bore our griefs and who carries our sorrows. Thank you, God, that because the last look of Jesus was not the look of death. We thank you, God, it was resurrection. We thank you, God, for that, for that time when the ultimate look will be seen and every eye shall behold it. He who is King of kings and Lord of lords. And every knee will bow, things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue will confess that he is Lord, glory. to the glory of you, the Father. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we thank you, thank you Jesus. 
that there is another look. So, Father, will you keep our eyes on you? Keep our heads lifted up. Thank you. Keep our hearts encouraged. Yes, when tears fall, wipe them. When cries are uttered, hear them. When groans emerge, pity them. Allow us to know that you, the Lord our God, you're still good. Your mercy is everlasting and your truth still endures to all generations. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. God bless you.